Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, this is our next instalment of uh, the Great British Sewing Bee Natter, um, or the Sewing Bee Natter for short. And this week, obviously, we're still joined by uh, the wonderful Kim Solomon, but our special guest this week is Mark Francis. Now, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you so much for, for having me along uh, today. It's a lovely to, to see you all and to have a, a dissection of everything we've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'll, we'll we'll get into that in a little bit of a moment. So, um, last week we had a giveaway. Um, and if Kim, if you can remind people what the giveaway was and who is the lucky winner this week? And the lucky winner this week, and I will get the name right this week, Alice. <laughs> Please, you know, I've written it down. It's Valerie Dugdale. Now, Valerie watches the Great British Sawn Bee with her husband, and actually has been watching the Sawn Bee Natter with us, and agrees with a lot of the comments that our previous guests and ourselves have, have made with regards to using the rotary cutter, um, about the commenting on colour rather than the actual sewing. Um, she would like to give, and I'm going to ask you about this later on, maybe in, in, in detail, Mark, um, she would like to give the contestants in real time more time to complete their garment so they'd have a finished garment. However, she appreciates that it would then have to be edited down uh, to reduce it for the program so that was a really good interesting comment and she also wants to ask the the next guest which is you mark about the different levels of sewing skills before you come into the great british sewing bee so i don't know whether we want to start with those alistair or um or we'll, we'll address them later on but also anybody who wants to join in and be in the chance of winning our next giveaway it's um, a prize from Vlieseline and you just have to comment and like and share um, the Sewn Bee Natter on the YouTube. So back over to you now, Alice. You're in charge today. I've got Patrick. Well, are you've got I'm Patrick. all right. I've got Patrick. <laughs> I've just got a kimono that I'll be wafting around in a little bit later. Um, but um, yes, yeah, so this week was 90s week. Now, I don't have any glow sticks, but if you watch my front of my glasses closely, you'll see the ring. And if I go like that, it sort of emulates the sort of the... Um, so it's sort of in a bit of a rave there. So 90s week was a bit of a challenge. Now, obviously, um, <clears throat> it kind of, um, it always gets me when you don't actually realise how young certain people are in the programme when they said, I wasn't even born in the 90s. And I'm like, well, I remember the 90s quite well. And also the fact that they were doing cargo pants by um, uh Mahar um, well, they made a nod to Maharishi. Now, I actually used to work for Liberty on the shop floor, and we used to have to sell uh, Maharishi um, trousers, and not one of those ever had a, an elasticated waistband. And the second thing is they used to retail for about £380 a pair. <laughs> really? They were so, so expensive, but we would have clients that would come in and buy six pairs at a time. Wow. It would just be, and they had these beautiful, up one leg, they used to have these beautiful, um, fully embroidered, um, either carp fish or dragons on them and loads of different things. So I remember that very, very well. Um, so they started off, so obviously um, is the pattern challenge. And obviously we know that, um, well, one thing we always have a bit of a gripe with, Mark, is the fact that when you actually see the show-stopping sample that the production team have done, which is the sort of benchmark, if you like, um, there are always quite a few issues with the finished sample, um, as opposed to when the judges are supposed to be critiquing against that sample. For instance, like the waistband on the sample wasn't sitting right. Um, and it was all a bit sort of like um, ski whiff at the top. Um, so I will open up the discussion. Uh, Mark, what did you think of the pattern challenge? Well, I remember wearing cargo uh, trousers um, uh, in the 90s. I mean, I, I, I was... In my in my most of my teens in the 90s but I wasn't really a very typical teenager to be honest I didn't wear any until much later into the 90s and I only had a green pair so I only ever had one pair um yeah the samples are interesting now they do apparently they do test all of the pattern challenges on sewers sometimes they're ex sewing bee people or other people in the sewing team uh, that they have they send the patterns out and they test it they see how long it takes these people to do it and then they'll 
they'll see what they need to do to fit it into the time scale that they want. And that could mean that you're losing pockets or linings or, or you know, finished insides or whatever to get it to fit. Um, uh, so th they do test it to check all that timings. So, and this does answer, was it Valerie's question? Yes, actually? it was Valerie, yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, about the timings is they, they told me that they, they time it so that they're all achievable, but with a bit of peril. That's how it that's how it was described to me. Um, but it's yes, I, I know what you're saying about the samples. Interestingly, also, the samples aren't necessarily in the room with us when we're sewing. They quite often do that bit separately and we don't see it. There were, there were some challenges I did and I thought I'd really like to see a sample on this one. And we didn't because it just wasn't in a room with us. Um, and I'm guessing what they use on the screen as their benchmark is one of those tested versions i'm guessing um because I'm, I'm with you sometimes they do have issues i found this one particularly whereas the the benchmark sample the waistband wasn't sitting correctly but n n the majority of the um of the contestants they weren't sitting correctly either lizzie had tried to pin hers in place now that begged the question was the pattern itself correct because they all made that well the majority of them seem to have that problem with the way the waistband was sitting now the comment that was made with lizzie was that uh uh hook and eye had been sewn on a wonk but actually the other ones where that criticism wasn't made all of the waistbands were wrong so one of the things that was we were asked about as well previously is the instructions that you're given those written instructions how good are they because sometimes I, I wonder Mm. It, the, the quality of the instructions, uh, from what I can gather uh, from talking to my other bees from other series, the quality can vary from series to series, I'm guessing, depending on who writes them. Uh, I've been told by some of the series five guys that the instructions they had were very, very minimal. I wouldn't say hours were minimal. Hours were probably quite basic, but they weren't full of details. You would read stuff and you think, what on earth does that mean? And, and you're just having to give it your best your best guess. They also have some odd techniques they want them to use. They seem, when they're doing elasticated waistbands, they like them to make the waistband, put the elastic in and then sew the whole thing on, which I find quite fiddly. And I'd probably make a bit of a mess of that as well. My own preference is to make the waistband with a chattel and then put your elastic in afterwards and then you can adjust the elastic for what you need. Um, so maybe that's why some of the waistbands were a bit mm -hmm. skew if perhaps. Mm -hmm. But then we all yeah. have our own favourite techniques, don't we? Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I don't. I think one of the big problems with <clears throat> that particular um, waistband was the t so the uh, the plackets for the actual um, trousers. Um, if you look at the if you if you go back onto the show and you look at the one the the um, the facing placket at, at the rear, the elastic protruded over it, which it shouldn't do. It should the two flat surfaces should be aligned, and the elastic should start exactly, uh, essentially where my thumbs are, so that you have those two nice flat pieces of fabric um, sewn together there, which then creates the actual um, zip. I mean, those types of zips um, to go in inside. I actually find this is my own. Um, personal um, preference I actually find those zips a lot easier to actually put in because you've got far more control because you're actually making um you're putting a zip into a, essentially a flat um surface whereas up to a certain point if you were to do say a, an invisible um zip in a dress <clears throat> one you've got more of a length and second of all you've actually got to in some cases you've got to incorporate a slight curve which means that when you're putting in your zip, sometimes the bottom can bobble. <clears throat> so I don't know who it was that made that. Um, I think it was Mia um, that said she was, um, these are the most difficult zips to put in. I I would slightly beg to differ. I would actually, hands down, I'd rather do that than putting in an invisible zip um, any any day of, of the week. Um, the other thing I felt was that um, for this pattern challenge I know that we're getting on and, and the contestants that we'd lend them down but I thought the points 
in which they were critiquing, there were so many things that they were looking out for this particular um, time. And I just thought some people were at a slight um, disadvantage. Again, some of the fabric choices, um, again, it's entirely up to them. But when with those um, billowing pockets, depending on what fabric choice you actually choose, will determine, you know, the actual outcome of those pockets. For instance, when I was on um, Savile Row, um, one of the Sultans of Brunei, he wouldn't wear the actual army surplus that was provided by the army. He used to bring the, that in and then we would have to make it from scratch, but bespokely so that he would and this was just this was just to meet troops and stuff like this this wasn't any military um, dress or anything but he had to have everything bespokely made um i just i'm guessing the, using uh, i'm guessing using nicer fabrics as well uh, well interestingly it, it wasn't at, he it was it was the real tough um cargo um drill it was exactly the same but just because um, he didn't want the ones that all the soldiers got. He wanted something that was a little bit more demure and fitted. But I got, the, I had the job of making them, but all of the stitching that was around all those things, and they have giant machines that have um, uh, jigs that actually get perfect sewing. I had to get ev everything completely perfectly done. So I know where they're coming from, but I don't personally find those types of pockets too difficult i thought a welted pocket i think would flummox people a lot more yes i think so i, I mean patrick called them bellow pockets and yeah. um i'm actually which i didn't think they were i'd call them cargo pockets is what i would call them do you know I'm, i am actually making a jacket right now with bellow pockets now do i have a bellow pocket to hand it's on the I bench somewhere yeah, because I'd actually put bellow pockets question mark. Um, that was one of the questions I was wanting to ask about. So this is, so it's actually got this kind of, this bell. So that will, this bit will be sewn down to the jacket. Then oh. you've got this bit here that, that, that bellows out. Yeah. So you've got this, this well, and it has this really complicated shape to sew together. Um, and that's what I call a bellow pocket. I call that a cargo. But anyway, it's I don't suppose it really matters. But they're not difficult to make, really. It's just a square of the gusset, really, isn't it? And you yeah. and you stitch and you stitch it down. So the the other thing was that whilst these cargo pants could be made in a variety of different fabrics, mm. I would have thought the fabrics with structure would have been easier for them to have achieved, particularly the pocket and the shape of the pocket, rather than the fabrics that were um, with, with less structure. Asma particularly picked quite um, a drape, more drapeable fabric. And what she had a problem with was that side seams, which had, they were bouncing. So I was wondering, Alistair, would you explain about the bouncing, you know, that, that wave effect that she had on the seams? How could she, she have avoided that? It's all, a lot of it's all to do with your tension on this actual sewing machine and not pulling, not pulling the seams through. You need to let the feed dogs actually do what you're wanting it to do. Um, also, um, so I'm a great fan of basting. Mm -hmm. So anyone that doesn't know what basting is, basting is 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 literally a really long running stitch which keeps the work really really flat. And when you're sewing. What it does is it keeps, it, especially fabrics like that, especially satins and silks, it keeps far more control and it's actually quicker. Well, in my opinion, because I've always basted, it's that when I saw later, um, when I saw later on Tony saying he was pinning within an inch and it was like every two centimeters, I was thinking a quick way around that and a quicker way would have just been to baste it. Mm -hmm basting because when you put a pin a straight object into two pieces of fabric you you make the fabric concave so you're almost you're almost fighting a losing battle ever so slightly but if you put a long running stitch through very delicately it keeps all the pack all the fabrics nice and neat together but i think because of the time that they've got and you see them all sort of like rushing through i mean did you did you clock during the whole show that Two people actually had walking feet this week. Mm. Yes. 
I noticed that actually. I never bothered using one because um, I did. I hadn't used one before myself at that particular point, and I hadn't practiced with theirs. So I, I I avoided it, thinking I'll stick to what I know at that particular point. But then at the time, I'd only been sewing for two years, and I hadn't done an awful lot of fabrics that needed it. So do they provide you... Sorry, interrupt you, Alistair. So do they provide you with the machine and the feet? Yes, uh, everything's there that we need. We, I mean, some people do bring a bit of kit. I did as well. I brought a little case that had some odds and ends in it. Um, but you didn't need to. Everything that we should have needed was there. Or if it wasn't, we had little, there's little boxes. It's the same ones we had on the tables. And it's full of needles, different kinds of needles for your machine and different feet. I mean, they don't explain them to you. That was the next so question. What... <laughs> yeah, no, they don't. They don't explain it to you. You have to know what they are and how to use it yeah. um, or, or you don't use it. So I wasn't confident in either attaching it to their machine or or using it on my own machine it just drops down so um that's not a problem because you could just pull Two it down and, it, and it's there sorry to interrupt you carry on i've got something that's arrived from alistair has just come to my door <laughs> <laughs> is it oh. alistair himself oh. is alistair in the back of a van being well, driven up to the door maybe well perhaps you never know i might even have a twin you know it's always been rumored but you never know I thought um, you might be in the caravan with all your fabric behind you being being towed along while you're sewing. Well, this is all... It, it, I might even be a hologram, Mark. <laughs> you, you may never know. You know, technology has come on. So, so that's really interesting you say that, that um, you actually have, because it's a question we've posed on several, several weeks. And obviously, um, we <clears throat> we had uh, Stuart Hilliard... Um, on um a couple of um times ago and um he was he was given us a lot of sort of like insight obviously he was in the first mm. series which was in its infancy then um how do you feel um how do you feel from when the program started um to what you sort of experienced and sort of see now how do you think the program has has migrated i mean i have a very cynical view um I've noticed in this program, for instance, <laughs> that there aren't a lot of technique sharing. And I put it down to the fact that the book that follows this series is a techniques book. So if they told you about the techniques in the program, there would be no sales for the book. So I'm assuming that that's why they've sort of edited that sort of bit out this time. They, they do go round and film you all the time, of course. So there's little face will pop up behind the desk and go, oh, what are you doing, Mark? And can you explain this and read the instructions out? So they do have the opportunity to do that if they want to, depending on what they film. But they film a lot, so there's stuff there. But then I suppose it's the balance between uh, the sewing audience, which is probably in the minority, compared to the audience which watches it for the general interest. Um, Sewing is is maybe slightly less accessible than baking, say to the Bake Off. You can watch a Bake Off and think, do you know what, I'm going to make macaroons this afternoon. But most people couldn't think, do you know what, I'm going to make cargo pants. They think, <laughs> well, I haven't got a pass, I haven't got a sewing machine, I don't know what I'm doing. But yeah. they'll watch it because they enjoy it and they, they like the kind of emotion and entertainment of it. Um, so it's quite a, an interesting balance they've got to try and get right but the whole sewing bee as a whole has progressed enormously over the nine series that i mean it's over a decade now um i mean when stuart hillard did series one it wasn't even going to be dressmaking focused it was going to be all kinds of kind of like uh home sewing curtains and pillowcases and all kinds of things to put over your toilet rolls or whatever it might be um and then they dropped in the, the, the dressmaking. And now it's gone a stage further than that. Someone's uh, one of the shows said they're almost doing stuff now that you would give an A-level art student to do. Mm. Like cutting up a painting to make yes. a garment. Um, yeah. Those kind of things, which are very interesting. But most sewers at home are not going to think, gosh, you know, I'm going to get that old canvas off the wall and cut it up because it's going to make a brilliant jacket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm. I think I'm in complete agreement um, with you <laughs> on that one. Um, <clears throat> shall we move on to the next section, which was um, the fancy dress section, mm. which 
I was a bit confused when they announced it. Um, the one that they had to make a fancy dress costume based on the nineties, but the the bit I didn't get, and then suddenly as pan to Esme saying, "I want to know who the person is," huh? and I was like. Oh, okay. So they have to make a, a costume that, um, you know, they can guess who it's going to end up going to be. Um, I thought it was very uh, interesting when you saw what they had provided them to make these costumes because I'm, I'm not quite sure a toilet seat cover um, would <laughs> help anybody make. Oh, no, you could have... Well, no, he wasn't fluffy. Mr. Blobby was um, smooth, wasn't he? So he wasn't... <laughs> he was, he was. Even, so you couldn't even make Mr. Blobby costume. I'm trying to think of something pink and furry, but... But the thing was, with that whole challenge, so <laughs> said it was home decor transformed uh, using textiles into... Uh, textiles inspired, inspired by a 90s icon. And that was the word, inspired. Mm. So... It didn't have, in my opinion, with that brief, it didn't have to be instantly recognisable. And the other thing was, I just felt it was unfair that um, Esme was unable to name that 90s icon. Uh, just because she didn't get it doesn't mean to say that when, you, when it was actually explained that they ticked the brief, as far as I was concerned. I, I thought that was a little bit unfair, marking people down because you didn't know obviously you know, was we had to do uh uh food items as a fancy dress for a child out of sleeping bags I remember and that. Es yeah esme was pretty bad at naming any of those as well apart yeah. from mine i actually wrote crisps along the top of it <laughs> 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 so she couldn't actually get mine wrong but yeah. i i quite agree and the inspired word uh, uh sort of got me on a few occasions as well we were asked to do a flamenco inspired outfit and that's what I did and everybody else did a costume uh, I felt personally um, and and that didn't sit well for me because you couldn't go out it. and I had a problem with this with the art one last week where they were making outfits inspired by a painting I'd like it to have been more wearable more something you could actually put on and go out in and, and not so figurative as in people were making actually an element from a painting which wasn't quite for me wasn't quite the point in doing it mm -hmm. um i think i would have struggled to think of a 90s icon that in the time that either they could recognize or, or it wasn't i mean i certainly couldn't have picked anybody from what um prodigy or j-lo oh. i might have thought of the spice girls if i saw the union jack stuff yes <laughs> i thought of the, the pink toilet seat um, Gordon the Gopher used to have a girlfriend called called uh, Glenda or Gloria, uh, I think it was. Uh, so you could have done a pink version of a Gordon the Gopher, but that's not an outfit. You right. had to do a whole Philip Schofield out outfit to, to go to go with them, wouldn't you? We're not allowed um, to mention Philip Schofield. No, we can't <laughs> mention him. Um, but it's 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 an interesting one. The um, transformation because they kind of throw all this stuff at you that may be slightly random, particularly in this case, and you've got to try and come up with something that in 90 minutes that they like. And I had three rules for me personally in my little head, which was think of an idea, don't change your mind, and don't stop sewing until the time runs out. Then just have to hope that you've got something that isn't a load of old rubbish nailed to a mannequin. Um, and it's, and you, couldn't, you couldn't hope for more than that, really, I don't think. So out of your transformations that you did, have you still got them or have you had to pop them in the bin? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got anybody's. Of, uh, well, I've got all of the uh, all of the items I made, all of the ones they sent back. They did lose a few, um, which I don't know how they could possibly do that. But that's the way these things go. But I, some of them are terrible. I mean, it's about the ideas oh. you're making it in 90. I say I do a lot of talks for like WIS and quota groups and all kinds of people in schools and what have you. Um, and something I say on there, which was, it's about the ideas. It's not about the execution. They're not looking for finished hems and perfect binding and all this kind of stuff, because it's just not going to happen in 90 minutes. But I also say, how, when would you ever 
need to make something under those circumstances. And the only thing I think of is if a kid comes to you and says, Mom, I need an outfit for school. Or when do you need it for, dear? Now. And you think, OK, well, I'm making a snowman outfit in 90 minutes before I chuck you on the bus. Yeah. I can't think of, or maybe the theatre, but, you know, outside of that, no. it's yeah. pretty minimal that you put yourself under that pressure. The general so consensus funny. throughout is that the transformation <laughs> challenge should go and that it should be, something else should be, should be put in its place. And and even on the, the comments that come in on our, our son being natter, the general consensus is, well, it's not wearable. Where are you ever going to wear it? Mm. Um, and it should really go and be replaced by something else or, 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 or maybe the other challenges given more time. The other thing that's come up in the past, which is something that, that I would like to, to resurrect again is we've always talked about the marking and on the Bake Off, for example, you have sections of marking and you know that so many points are going to go to this, that and the other. Now, it seems on this particular series, um, certainly the, the last challenge, that made to measure challenge has been the be all and end all because mm -hmm. Lizzie did so well last week. Uh, Vicky did amazing in the first two challenges, I thought, with the cargo pants and the transformation. And yet, I mean, don't get me wrong, Asma's final made to measure was outstanding and that's something we can talk about. But do you do you get any guidance with regards to you're going to get more points for, say, say 20 points for the um, the pattern challenge, 10 points for the transformation and 70 points for the made to measure? Did you get any brief no, on that? No, there's, there's no guidance like that at all. Um, it's You get no feedback apart from what you're seeing in the in the judging, which really? I must say, yeah, that's the judging isn't just a quick sound bite and a hold of a paddle like on Strictly. It is a full and proper analysis of what you've made. So you can see it might appear that someone's waistband was common to criticize more than someone else's, but you'll probably find if you watch the whole hour or two hours or however long it takes them to film that bit, you might find that they've actually criticized that same bit with everybody. It just doesn't go into the into the final comments. Um, but they, they do check everything quite thoroughly. Um, but no, there's no guidance. You just have to have a feeling, you, you know, you might, I mean, uh, Lizzie might have thought, well, I've got to do really well, uh, or it's curtains for me. Uh, mm -hmm. So you do get a kind of a feeling, but um, it's it's much more kind of fun than that. There's a lot more camaraderie and just doing the best you can. Uh, and I think most, me certainly, and I think most people, you do the best for yourself. Yeah. That's that's what I was trying to do. Just do the best you can in the circumstances that you've got. Yeah. Um, and that's all you can hope for, really. It's just a bit of fun. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> moving on to the made to measure challenge. Um, the one thing that I actually really picked up on yesterday was I was so pleased to see plus size models. However, mm. the models who were Hmm. rather smaller hmm. with ways looked amazing because they strutted and it was the quality of the way they were able to come down that catwalk and 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 show off the garment to its full whereas the 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 larger lady shall we say the the the, the slightly larger models didn't quite have that pizzazz on the um on the catwalk and i really felt that that actually does influence certainly what the viewers see and I don't know if that influences what the judges see is that before we actually go into the nitty-gritty of that made to measure challenge Mark what's your thoughts on that? The, the models are an interesting one now I put my foot in it slightly in, in a very well-meaning kind of way behind the scenes because I said to them having got to know them um, I said you're not proper models are you and they all got a bit offended by this and I, but what I meant was they do a lot of other things. They're singers, actors, they're extras, they're dancers. Some of them have radio programs and they happen to be doing this thing on sewing me as a model. So I thought, oh, we're getting a model. They'll be off to Milan doing, you know, Paris Fashion Week or they're off to do a fitting with Vivian Westwood or whatever. But it's not that kind of model at all. Some of them can be. Um, there's a lady with a rather large, beautiful afro, and I think she she was on my series as well, and I think she is a model 
but if you if you like but the others aren't necessarily so sometimes they're even relatives of the production team uh that, that they get to to do this kind of stuff depending on who they can find so that might be why some of them uh perform on the catwalk better than others some might be more used to it some it might be a bit kind of that they're not their comfort zone i suppose that that could explain that but it is nice we had no plus size models at all yeah. on our series so it was really nice although yeah. i'm not sure that red dress looked very 90s to me but um that was was that vicky's red dress with the 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 binding that's the, the board, one yeah the boarding it was had the boarding on yeah yeah mm. Yeah, I I personally I agree with you, Mark. Um, I um that that didn't even scream anything nineties um to me at all. Mm -hmm. Um, and also when she said, I mean, fair play to her. I mean, when she sorry, I'm looking at my notes so I don't get this wrong. And um, what I've written down. So Vicky was saying, you know, I've I've looked into, you know, plus, I wanted to do something for plus size, which actually we've been. Um, asking for throughout, you know, actual real bodies and things like that. And she was saying, and she picked this really obscure um, um, person from the 90s. And I'm thinking, well, there's a really, really famous supermodel who was a plus size model who isn't now. Um, but why did you not, that didn't even come in? I mean, if I mention the word Isabella Blow, that might give you a bit of a clue who I'm actually referring to. Oh, no, I, no, I, I don't know. So I don't Sophie know. Dahl. Is who? Sophie, Sophie Dahl. Dahl. Oh, OK. So she was one of the very first sort of like plus size um, supermodels that actually was brought in by Isabella Blow and Alexander McQueen. Um, and... Isabella Blow kept on um, referring to her, you know, her wonderful busty bosoms and all that kind of thing, the way that she used to go off. And <clears throat> Sophie Dahl was, you know, was a, a larger um, model. I mean, she did um, Yves Saint Laurent's opium campaigns and all of that. I mean, now she's very, very, she's... She's tiny now, isn't she? She's, she's tiny now, but when she started off, she... She was a plus size model and she was being booked for Westwood, all of the big, big names. So I'm surprised that she didn't um, necessarily pick someone like that or even look at someone like that and thought, well, actually, I it was very beautifully executed on the top. But in terms of visual impact for me, it it was it, it was a structured um, boned top with just a long skirt. That yeah. that that was essentially what it was, and if you if you take off the bodice and you look at the volume that you've got to play with um, underneath the bodice, you could have done so so much with that. Even just adding, an you know a top um, layer overlay piece on top of it or something like that. It wasn't my. I wrote down it wasn't my favorite. I thought she did very well in the two other challenges, but I thought the the actual final garment she produced. The bodice was fantastic, but the overall look I didn't I didn't like very much. I mean, in, in fairness to the sewers, once they get the brief, they, they have very little time to prepare it. It's quite a knee-jerk reaction, I, I, I felt for me. And, and as I was I was lucky to get through to the quarter final, uh, then by the time I was getting to those mate measures, it had been quite a number of weeks since I planned it. And now then thinking. I could do something else. I could do this. I could do something much better than knowing what I've gone through the last few weeks. And there isn't the opportunity to change it by that point. Um, but you also get, you don't get any feedback because mm. you tell them what you're doing and exactly what the pattern is, the fabric, how you're going to make it and fit it, everything. So they know everything. Um, and you just get a, thank you very much. And then, but there's no kind of, I thought there might be a bit of a kind of, oh, it's too simple or it's too this or someone else has done the same pattern. Could you look at something else? You get nothing at all. Um, so that's you don't have, a, because yeah, you, you get no measure. That's interesting because in the past, it's been criticised about, um, uh, viewers have criticised it and experts have criticised it about the fabric choices and mm. fabric is so important. And mm. I thought that when you submitted those, 
the the I know they want a disaster, they love a disaster <laughs> because it makes good it makes good TV. But I, I would have I would have hoped, and I'm really surprised that you don't get some guidance of that's maybe a really good pattern, but that choice of fabric is just not gonna not gonna do it. So is it it's possibly not a sewer who's actually looking at those emails. It's it's a production person. Yeah, it's it's quite possible. Um, mm. I, I know my my flamenco skirt again my, on my last made to measure. Um, I was told by the producer afterwards that it was too simple, uh, which I was never told at any point until that, um, which made me a little annoyed thinking, well, just tell me it was too simple. I could have done something else. Um, and Esme was critical of my fabric choice. Um, so, so that there was no feedback it, it, at all. I suppose that gives it a level playing field. How much, if it's a competition, should they uh, guide the sewers as to what they should or shouldn't be doing? Um, I mean, we we mentioned briefly fabrics for the pattern challenge as well. And, and we could I could just drop in that in the pattern challenge, there is the, if you like, correct fabric is there for want of a better word but there's lots of other things as well right. so if they want to make pleather cargo trousers then they can but i would choose a stable cotton as you would say just something that's going to look good but it's that balance on the going back to the made to measure you need it to look good you need it to be have a bit of peril you need it to be or if it's going to be simple, it's going to be really well made. You've got to find that balance. You don't want to over egg it so much you can't get it done. Yeah. You don't want it to be too simple that it, you, you sat there um, with nothing to do. Or you, you, the risk is that you become a lackadaisical and don't particularly finish it well. Because you think, got it licked. It's easy, yeah. this one. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very, And there's no clocks in there, so you can't time yourself like you would. Why is not? No, oh. no clock, unless you're wearing a watch. Ah, right. Right. That's interesting as well. Do Does the presenter annoy you as they're walking around? Is she in all the time or he's in all the time? Because I'll be honest with you, this particular presenter, she would she would annoy me. I loved Claudia. I loved Joel Isis. But this one, A, I question what she wears sometimes. And B, I just think, go away. Let them, the, the time's so limited. Let them get on with it. I did have Joe come round to me on a transformation challenge in the last five minutes. And I was, I can't think which one it was, but I was going hell for leather, trying to get something that looked half good at the machine for a transformation. And he comes bobbing along to come and have a chat to me. And I think, in my mind going, oh, no, go away. I haven't got time. I really want to get this finished. But it is TV. So you've got to yeah. try and have yeah. allowances for the fact that it's TV. Right. Um, but but I, they, they, they know when to come over. That yeah. They're watching the whole time, the whole time, even if you think it's between uh, between shots or whatever, and you're not actually doing anything, then they're, st they're still watching what's going on. There's occasionally stuff will go in that you think wasn't being filmed or was in a point when they weren't filming, but they were. Right, right. So to <laughs> talking about the others, uh, now the one thing I, I wrote down with Tony, scuba again. Oh, yes. I just went scuba again. The diagonal line was great. It looked really, really smashing. Um, yes, he had problem with drape under the arms, but it was just how many times has he used scuba fabric? People have their favourites, don't they? People have their favourites. Um, uh, uh, Matthew was doing harnesses and everything. Um, you know, uh, um, Nicole in my series do everything in kind of leather or leopard print and all these loud colours. I suppose it's our own personal go-to kind of style and we you kind of you kind of draw on what you know and what you like to do and maybe that's what is comfortable with it looked good though it looked good I, I just thought you know you're talking about showing what you can do and if you're submitting what you're doing and the fabric choice that you're doing I'm surprised nobody went scuba again because any <laughs> opportunity, Tony gets scuba into, <laughs> yeah. into his... Into his, uh, into his I must admit, it's something I've, I've never I've never sewn with, and um, I certainly didn't do it on the sewing bee. <laughs> that was the first opportunity. <laughs> I've, I've avoided that one so far. I haven't felt the need to use it. <laughs> well, scuba's a, <clears throat> scuba's a very interesting fabric, so it, it sort of came around in the fashion industry from about 
six, seven years ago, um, when the couture houses, especially people like um, Victor and Rolf and um, Costume National, they were using it. Um, and um, it was... It, it was a sort of a new take on taffeta. And what I mean by that is that taffeta as a silk has a lot of structure and it, and it will stay where it needs to be. Whereas scuba gives you that really modern sort of minimalist look, but it gives you that ultimate structure. Um, it's, in my opinion, scuba is, um, once you get going with scuba, scuba's actually quite a, a nice, pliable um material to work with so for instance because it's slightly thicker and it's not a woven fabric um when you're matching pattern pieces it's kind of a little bit easier to make sure you get all of that you know perfectly um done i it'll be interesting to see if he does move away if next week if he does actually move away from scuba i mean <clears throat> I know when it was filmed, it was cold, but obviously, you know, someone needs to tell him to ditch the woolly hat because in this heat, I think we're all going, woof, you know. It's his bit... glasses under there. No, I know. He had his glasses. I think, he, I think he's sneaking in contraband underneath. <laughs> oh, in fact, could be, couldn't they? Could have his well, snacks. Take... He could have his crisps Let... and his biscuits, his glasses. Oh, they give us snacks. <laughs> I don't know. He puts no, it they... on his hat. <laughs> but they give you a little lunchbox. Oh. What's there's in the lunchbox? Lunch Come on, BBC, what's in the lunchbox? Oh, it's not very... There's a piece of fruit. There's usually some crisps, some kind of chocolate bar, and then lots of sweets, like Harry Bow and things like that. So, Rosie, my model, and I... Because the whole made-to-measure thing it takes ages to film the catwalk and the judging. And so you sat there, uh, and I, I used to line up sweets uh, it, behind my sewing machine. So Rosie and I would sit there eating sweets... <laughs> in the back. I don't think you see it in shot, but we're, we're, that's what we're doing each time, just to relieve the boredom. Well, I'd put it in the little the little, little, little uh, door the on the centre, <laughs> yeah, put, put them in there. That's see, that could be a good ruse, but what you need to do, so they won't come and film you, stuff a load of Harry bow in your mouth, and they know that they can't communicate with you, and it won't make nice TV. <laughs> so you, you missed a trick there. <laughs> maybe, maybe I did. I didn't, but maybe I should have pushed. Yes, I don't know. I'll never know now, will I? See what if if only you'd known. You know, it's it's one of those things. Life like experiences. If only I'd known, this is what I would have done something differently. If only I'd known. Don't curse when you go wrong because they'd be like, and they're like fighter pilots, and they're straight yeah. over to see you. Yeah, no bad um, language. <laughs> you, you'd be there with your own picker. Yeah, <laughs> doing it really quietly. Excuse me. <clears throat> one thing that came out last night that I have to say really. Um, I took a, a gasp of breath was when Asma said that she made bras. Mm. And the impression that we got was that it was it was quite a professional thing that she did. And then a dress, don't get us wrong, it was absolutely stunningly beautiful. But had she not been a bra maker before, she may not have achieved that as well as she, she executed it beautifully, but she's well practiced at that. Yes. Again, when, when somebody comes out and says, I made bras practically for a living, and I just thought, hmm, I thought that when you went onto the sewing bee, because I have had people in when I had the shop, um, they were looking for contestants, and they wanted people who weren't professional. You, you, you know, for example, Alice, you couldn't apply, I couldn't apply. Um, and to have that level of expertise, bra making, I mean, it's not the easiest thing to do in the world. Mm -hmm. I think that they, that's an advantage. They do check in as much as they talk to you about your level of professionalism and they do check it out um, as to exactly, you know, if you work in a haberdashery, that's fine. As long as you're not actually maybe undertaking alterations or that kind of thing, then you'd be OK. So I'm guessing they've checked it and that she's only done it for herself. That was my assumption um, and not done it for to, to, to sell um at least that would be within the rules mm. um 
unless they've changed the rules. I, but I can't imagine they have. Liz, in my year, she made her own bras, but hers came about because she couldn't find any that she liked anymore. So she took a part, one that she had that she liked, and she copied it. And since then, she, she's only got her own homemade bras. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but you do kind of revert back to, in those scenarios, those skills that you have. Um, so I could, for me, I could picture pattern blocks, shapes. So if I was cutting something out for a transformation, I could chalk up a bodice shape because I can picture it or for a jacket shape or whatever, but I couldn't drape because I've never done it before. Whereas some people were the other way around. And this is, I suppose, the level playing field that they try to create is that everybody has a different level of experience. You might have a, someone's been sewing for 40 years, but they've only made dress, uh, dresses for children. Or you might have someone like me who's only made menswear. So that's, that, that's sort of our own little niches that we find it creates the level playing field because we're all advantaged and disadvantaged at the same time. That's interesting. And do you think as a man on a, con on a show like that, which I have to say is more orientated to women's wear rather than men's wear, mm. that that is a disadvantage in the main? Um, possibly. I hadn't done any women's wear at all when I went to do the sewing bee, and I've only done them since because of my work on Sewing Street. Um, it's not really an area that um, interests me. Um, I'd much because the men's wear is what is is what ticks my box. Mm -hmm. um, but there was stuff I could apply. There's techniques that cross over from one to the other. If you're putting a zip in, you're putting a zip in. And the chances are it's going to be the same. It might be left or right handed, perhaps. I've done shirts, but I haven't done blouses. But there's a lot of techniques that draw from the same kind of point of view. But then uh, it, it do, you do feel at a disadvantage. But I suppose the thing with sewing bee is it does drive you to just go, this is what I'm doing this morning. Um, you know, I, it's eight o'clock in the morning and I'm making a basque. I've never made one before. I've never studied one. I've never even thought about it, but I'm making a basque. And at the end of it, you think, do you know what? It's not bad. It's not bad at all. Four hours work, having never done it before and with no help. Mm -hmm. And it can make you, um, it can make you very proud of what you can achieve, even if you're not winning mm -hmm. um, or you, even if you don't get to those last few final shows you can get an immense sense of pride just by being there and having a go. And that pride you get from what you've made. And it's not top quality. It's not overlocked, probably. There's probably no lining in it. Um, and it probably wouldn't be extremely wearable. But within the given parameters of what you're, what you're thrown at, um, you are kind of putty in the production team's hands. And, uh, and it's what you get out of that, which can be the changer so Alistair you obviously went to um to college at St Martin in the Fields and studied fashion were you did you want to go towards women's fashion or were you forced into that because that was the courses that were available at that time no 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 <clears throat> so I was just uh, I was a slight bit of an anomaly so um I I I applied to St Martin's um the year before I got in, and this was before I had done, um, this is just when I, I had literally not even finished my A-levels. And um, I went to go <clears throat> to have an interview and um, they said, oh, well, um, we don't have any, um, we don't have any more, we'd like to offer you a place, but we don't have any more places in women's wear to offer you, um, but we do have a place in men's wear. Right. And I said, no doesn't interest me at all it, it's women's wear or nothing and there and then they gave me an unconditional offer to enroll um they, they saved me a place for the following year right. um, so that I would do it now the normal access route when uh, it may have changed a little bit now but um whenever art and design and well the the arts if we encompass it in that those students uh, rather than going straight into university once you do your a levels or GCSEs, you would then go and do an access course, which is called a foundation course, yeah. uh, which for a lot of artists and designers and, and photographers and, and whoever, um, sometimes 
young people know they they enjoy art or mm -hmm. enjoy design or, or whatever it is, but they don't actually know w where to to specialize in. The, a foundation course, when you take it, allows you to do a, a fashion segment where you do women's, men's, you do shoe design, you do millinery, you do all sorts to give you a taster of everything. And then yeah. you, you start to wheedle it down. So for instance, I did fine art, which I really loved doing as well. Uh, photography, I really liked. Textile design, I really liked. But for me, ever since, I used to watch the original Come Dancing with my gran. Um, literally, I knew exactly what I was going to do. Right. And I remember way back when, it was when the Close show um, was still on air. And, you know, you've got Jeff Banks and um, um, presenting it. And I remember um, this week they um, they mentioned this um this figure called uh, John Galliano, who had just graduated from this very prestigious university in London called Central St. Martins. And I watched this final collection that they had reshot. And I remember running into the kitchen and saying to my mum, I'm going to London and I'm going to live in a house with a big black door. Because obviously <laughs> as a kid, you think that's what it, and she would just sort of like nodded, but literally all those years I did. The interesting thing about, um, pattern cuts that so when you I've wanted heard... to um did you want to design for margaret thatcher is that what you meant by that <laughs> <laughs> no funny enough it wasn't um but no i mean well, she i actually think she had quite a for, uh, it was quite a formidable look but it, it will never it will never be forgotten let's say that so it did it, it ticked a few boxes let's just say it wasn't scaparelli or moogler but we were, you know she was you know she, she was sponsored by Elnet. I mean, I, you know, you can't get any better. Than that. Um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have smoked a cigarette next to her. She would have gone. Um, but the interesting thing when I, um, when I was at um, St Martin's, the, and also um, when I um, started my business on Savile Row, um, the tailors, for instance, who had had been tailoring for for men. Um, the interesting thing about a women's wear pattern cutter, a women's wear pattern cutter can quite easily pattern cut for men because uh, women's wear pattern cutters are so used to the 3D form in terms of there's a lot more lumps and bumps. You've got um, you've got boobs and you've got bums and you've got tummies and all that kind of thing to incorporate. So once you take water that down and take it, strip it all down and you're, you're creating very clean lines, men's wears difficulty is it's all about the detailing and it's all about those tiny little uh nuances we could just be the color of a lining inside a, a a welted pocket or or something or a tiny stitch detail there's there's very little room for error when it comes to menswear because it has to look pristine uh, whereas women's wear you can add diamantes you can add feathers you can do all sorts of different things mm, that's so really there's different there's different challenges in both um but menswear which is the next um episode yes. next yes. week that's going to be very 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 interesting oh is it menswear next week yeah yes, it is menswear oh. made to measure it's definitely men made to measure for menswear yes it should <laughs> be really good mark who do you think's going to win with who's left now well, I think for me, it's been clear who's nudging towards that way quite clearly is asthma for mm -hmm. quite for quite some time, um, because I thought she'd won other garments of the weeks, but she's certainly, but I don't think she has. But she has yeah. gone first in a quite a lot of challenges. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think it's something about people so is in the medical profession. Yes. Uh, well, if you're stitching that, people that up, like, <laughs> you're stitching skin. <laughs> Well, this is it. She's, um, I think she's a breast surgeon, I believe. Uh, Claire, who won our series, uh, she's she was uh, a cancer specialist, yeah. um, not a surgeon. Her mother was told her uh, uh, that she was not to be a surgeon, she had to be a, a doctor. Right. Um, and there's other, and and uh, who was the other one uh, who was won last uh, year? She was part of the um, because she was in during COVID, she it was to do with lungs. She was definitely, I can't remember her name, but yes. 
she was training, wasn't yeah, she? she was training a horse. So yeah. yes, there's it? something about medical professionals that seem to win at the oh. moment. Oh no, Patrick's gone south. Patrick's foot. <laughs> come on, Patrick. I told you not to drink until after the sewing bean after. Oh, do you know what I noticed about Patrick? What his head? No, about the real Patrick. Oh, the real. <laughs> he meant Mike. <laughs> he was. He is the real one. <laughs> this was... is the real Patrick. <laughs> Don't, don't, oh, Kim. don't you start to worry me now. <laughs> I'll, I'll be checking him for stains later. <laughs> oh, he's just working. There's two ways you can read that one. <clears throat> yes, exactly. <laughs> well, she might have slipped holding a cup of coffee. You never know when she was walking past him. I may have to. No, he wasn't. He wasn't wearing a tie. Yes. It's because he was he was embracing the 90s. Actually, I thought Patrick on this particular one, this Patrick's just going to... Uh, Patrick, just go over there and behave yourself, will you, for five minutes? Thank you. I'll just reposition you so you can still see he's here. Um, I actually thought Patrick was really funny this week. He came out with a few mm. uh, one-liners, which is... Uh, he was less less staged, shall we say. <laughs> he, was, he was good. He, he must have been on, the, on Esme's gin down in the dressing room, perhaps. Um, we see his he, one of his best um, friends because obviously I used to bump into Patrick pretty much every morning um, on Savile Row, and he always came in and he's his you know his um, old fashioned bike with his bicycle clips and stuff like that on, and we used to have a chat for five minutes uh, whilst he went and opened his big posh shop, and I went down into my basement. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, but a, apart from Apart from that, he his one of his um, very good friends is a, a gentleman called Giles Deacon, who is a women's wear designer slash DJ. So uh, I can imagine that um, Patrick isn't as innocent as he may look. He's channeling his other, you know, his DJ, possibly. <laughs> oh, you see, you should have been at the sewing bee rap party. The stories <laughs> I can tell you once he's dead. Oh. <laughs> Bless you. Well, so, once he becomes decommissioned, if that is ever going to happen, <laughs> then it's open season then. <laughs> oh, I just remember what I was going to ask you, Alistair, uh, because you mentioned Come Dancing. Uh, was it the Terry Wogan ones you were watching? Uh, no, mine was with Marty Kane. And my gran had me believe up until I was about the age of 14, that because we used to go to Blackpool every summer, um, and she had me believe that they were dancing at the top of the tower. And I and I thought, well, that's an awful... How did they get all the people up there? And my grand says, oh, they, you know, they've got lifts, you know. And I was thinking Marty Kane was up there, you know. And all I had visions of was them dancing up on top of the thing. Until later, I got to see the... Um, when, my, um, when my grand was much, much older and frailer, I gave her a whirl around the ballroom. Um, Bless you. Oh. Well, but, yeah. you know, on, a few months back on BBC Four, they were repeating some Terry Wogan come dancings. I think it's from about 1977 or thereabouts. And uh, the commentary made me howl. It really did. Uh, because it was so, to our ears now, it was just so, uh, so odd. Mm -hmm. And there's some voiceover going, and Brenda is wearing a dress of red and gold <laughs> chiffon. Doesn't she look lovely? And things like this. It was just hilarious. Well, they'd give people's measurements out as they were dancing around the floor. That's so inappropriate now, isn't it? <laughs> Wouldn't be allowed. Anyway, we've we've taken up such a lot of your time, Mark. It's been an absolute joy to talk to you. But before you go, if anybody wants to follow Mark, you are let you do yourself the so socials and also where they can catch up with you, Mark. Ah, well, you can follow me on all kinds of social media um, using the, the, the handle at SoMarkFrancis, uh, or you can go to my website, SoMarkFrancis.com, and have a rummage around there. Look at my blog or my shop or whatever you like. Um, you can see me in Kenilworth on, at East Chase Farm um, for textiles and tipples. Uh, yes, tipples, not, 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 with a T, um, where there will be, uh, with, with the, with the lovely Emma from Clothatelia, where you can come and you can have, you can book your lunch, you can try her homemade gin uh, that she sells, uh, and you can buy her walls and all our fabric and lots of bits and pieces and happy lunch. It's going to be beautiful. Or catch me along with lots of other people at the uh, the knitting and stitching shows, Harrogate and Ali Pali, 
and also the creative craft shows in Farnborough, Exeter, and then back at the NEC just in time for Christmas. Brilliant. That's great. Now, Alistair, you have got a very special discount for everybody, haven't you? Yes. So yes. if you... Um, remind, shop... sure. Just remind him. <laughs> you remind me. Are you making sure? Well, yeah, I am, <clears throat> as we say in Scotland, I'm getting a bit glated. <laughs> um, but um, <clears throat> so yes, we do have a, um, a discount code on the House of Alistair website. So to get 15% off, all you need to do is you just need to put at checkout. It will ask you if you have a discount code. And you just need to put BEE15. So all capitals and 15. So B is in the buzzy B and 15. And that'll get you 15% off our entire website, even the Visaline products. Amazing. So you are generous to a fault. Oh, he is. He's very good. So to, to I'll, I'll put the, the link in for everybody down below in case they haven't got that. But all I can say is thank you so much. Alistair, who have we got next week joining us? I can't remember. I'm hopeless. Oh, I've got, sorry, I, that's one of the lists I, I didn't. Um, I've got a list. He normally has photographs of all the contestants, you see. He hasn't quite put a black Sharpie marker through them. But yes, we, ha we are joining. <laughs> <laughs> God. <laughs> Oh, he's away. Is that what he does? Is it like a hit list? Yeah, it could be a hit list. Just if you haven't got a big black mark through, you're still in it. Where's he gone? He's got to try and find out who it is because if I was more efficient, I would have been able to tell you. Straight I, was do <coughs> I was doing a runner. I've you, got two names runner. in my head. But... Yeah. <laughs> I did want right. to say the wrong so, one. No, because it was because I didn't. I didn't remember whether it was Becky or it was uh, Sarah, but Sarah Payne on the 12th, um, she's uh, coming in on next week. And then the week after that, we have um, we have Becky Cole and um, then the week. So the very the finale, uh, the final, final. The final. <laughs> the final. Um, is a uh, that's going to be John Scott will be returning. Oh, and Lizzie Curtis is coming back for the penultimate uh, week right. as well. Remember, yes, and, yes. and, and also Deborah, <laughs> who was one of the so many oh, yes. from last year, is in our final one. So we've got a great lineup. Mark, thank you so much. Give our love to Clive. I will indeed. And, thank you very uh, much for having me. And I will no doubt see you at Festival of Quilts. Oh, I'll well, be there. Yes, I'll be unveiling something. But well, not me personally, but we'll be unveiling something very special from the Terence Higgins yes. Trust. Well, I'll bump into you. We can maybe nip to the Prosecco bar and have a little, a little oh, drink, a cheeky one, <laughs> just a little one. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, everybody, and take care. Is that a little bottle? A little bottle, Magnum. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll talk. That's another. That's another YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get round to that one. Thank that's you very much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.